<laughs> We're mostly trustworthy, I, I think. Um, thank you, Dr. Leonard, for um, for inviting me. It's um, it's a privilege to be here. Um, again, my name is Shawnee Haugen. I'm an FDA microbiologist um, in the pre-market reviewing division for GI endoscopes, and I'll be talking about testing duodenoscopes for cleaning and disinfection. FDA regulates duodenoscopes um, under a regulation for all GI scopes and urological scopes. This is under 21 CFR 876.1500. Duodenoscopes are class two devices, meaning that they, um, they require pre-market notifications to FDA, um, otherwise known as a 510K, um, prior to marketing those devices in the US. And they have a long history of use in the US, um, even before FDA regulation of medical devices in 1976. Okay, so for the device design, I'm mostly going to be focusing on the, um, the distal tip of the scope, which is the part that is um, first inserted into the patient. So um, as you've heard, most flexible endoscopes are forward viewing, but duodenoscopes are side viewing and they have an elevator. The elevator mechanism allows deflection of instruments exiting the, um, the instrument channel. When raised, the elevator changes the angle of accessory instruments up to a nearly 90 degree angle or perpendicular to the scope. Um, and this angulation is necessary to access the um, pancreatic and bile ducts um, for the instrument. Okay, so this is a schematic of, an, of the interior of a duodenoscope. In addition to the um, biopsy suction channel, which is in red, and the air water channel in black and white, which are present on um, just about any GI scope, Duodenoscopes also have um, this elevator wire channel, which um, is depicted in blue. So this is a very narrow channel that houses a thin um, metal wire that allows for control of the elevator at the distal end of the scope. Okay, in early versions of duodenoscopes, the elevator wire channel was exposed to patient soil, meaning um, blood or bile or any other patient bodily fluid. In those open elevator wire channel duodenoscopes, the elevator wire channel um, needed to be cleaned and disinfected between patient uses. But because this channel was so narrow, it was technically challenging to accomplish. So um, to avoid having to reprocess the elevator wire channel, duodenoscope manufacturers sealed the elevator wire channel with one or two O-rings. This seal is intended to prevent soil from entering the elevator wire channel um, and consequently, the elevator wire channel was no longer um, capable of being reprocessed, cleaned and disinfected. Um, currently, all actively marketed duodenoscopes in the US have a closed or sealed elevator wire channel, um, although open elevator wire channels are still being used in the US. And there are three manufacturers of duodenoscopes in the US, it's Fujifilm, Olympus, <coughs> and Pentax. So previously, um, we knew that cleaning and disinfecting the long, narrow channels in an endoscope posed a challenge to, um, to reprocessing. It was technically challenging. So device manufacturers focused their efforts on demonstrating that those long, narrow channels could be effectively cleaned. Um, we now know that um, in addition to the long, narrow channels, the duodenoscope distal tip also poses a challenge for reprocessing, and that's what I'll be talking about next. So in the next two slides, I'll be showing close-up views of the duodenoscope distal tip to illustrate the crevices at the distal tip that we believe pose a challenge to reprocessing. These figures are representative of all closed elevator wire channel duodenoscopes, and although there may be dimensional differences among different makes and models of duodenoscopes, um, the overall designs are similar in that um, you know, one or two O-rings are used to seal off the elevator wire channel. So in this figure, we have a close-up of the distal tip. All areas shaded in purple reveal areas of the scope that can be exposed to patient soil during a procedure. And as you can see, the area up to and including um, the distalmost O-ring um, that seals off the elevator wire channel could potentially be soiled um, during use. This is a cross-section of a duodenoscope distal tip. And I've highlighted the areas of um, the tip that are accessible to patient soil, but um, would be challenging to process. You can see it's all around um, the elevator mechanism itself. 
these areas can be as small as a fraction of a millimeter, and so it's understandable that they are um, particularly challenging to clean and disinfect. So as Herb mentioned, um, FDA has been working with device manufacturers as they update and validate their reprocessing instructions. The release of the revised instructions began about a year ago in March of 2015 and has continued since then. The agency believes that when followed, these updated, validated reprocessing instructions demonstrate consistent and reliable cleaning and high-level disinfection of these duodenoscopes. In the last part of my talk, I'll discuss the testing that was conducted to support these revised instru instructions, but I'd first like to talk um, a bit more background on reprocessing. So reprocessing is defined as um, validated processes used to render a medical device which has been previously used or contaminated fit for a subsequent single use. Um, these processes are designed to remove soil and contaminants by cleaning and then to inactivate microorganisms by disinfection or sterilization. So it's typically um, a two-step, at least a two-step approach. Different devices require different um, types of reprocessing and to determine the level of reprocessing necessary to make a device safe for reuse, we use the Spalding classification, um, which is um, based on the risk of infection from the device, and that's primarily based on the type of patient contact that is made. So on one end, we have um, intact skin um, as the patient contact, and on the other end, we have normally sterile tissues or blood, and we then we have this middle category um, for semi-critical devices. These are devices that contact intact mucous membranes or non-intact skin. Um, those devices should be cleaned and steri steri excuse me, sterilized, but when sterilization is not practicable, based on the compatibility of the device with practical sterilization methods, high-level disinfection is acceptable. Gastrointestinal devices, including duodenoscopes, are semi-critical devices according to the Spalding classification. And since flexible GI scopes are not compatible with practical terminal, st terminal sterilization methods such as steam sterilization, they are most commonly subjected to cleaning followed by high-level disinfection. Okay, so this is an overview of endoscope reprocessing. Um, as I mentioned, um, reprocessing itself is a multi-step procedure. For endoscopes, the very first step is to conduct manual pre-cleaning. So pre-cleaning is essentially flushing um, the channels with water or detergent. Pre-cleaning is a step that cannot be um, replaced by an automated endoscope or processor, so this is always conducted manually. At that point, um, the, the device is checked for leaks, and then manual cleaning can occur. And so this is going to be the brushing, the flushing, the immersion um, of the scope. For um, for duodenoscopes, we have been recommending that the devices undergo manual cleaning of the distal end, including the elevator area, even when processed in an automated endoscope or processor that is FDA cleared to replace one or more cleaning steps. And that's just based on the, um, the reports that we've, reports of infections that we've been receiving. After manual cleaning, the device can be high level disinfected or sterilized. I want to point out that FDA has also been working with the manufacturers of automated endoscope processors to conduct robust testing um, of their AERs with duodenoscopes, um, similar to the testing that duodenos duodenoscope manufacturers conducted and that I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, FDA maintains a website listing the AER manufacturers that have provided accept acceptable testing of their AERs with duodenoscopes. And so if you have questions, um, you know, please feel free to refer to FDA's website on that. Okay, I'll now move on to validation of duodenoscope processing instructions. In March of 2015, FDA finalized a guidance document titled Reprocessing Medical Devices in Healthcare Settings, Validation Methods and Labeling. This is an update to a guidance document from 1996 um, on a similar topic. One of the biggest changes um, between these two documents um, is that the 1996 version of the guidance really focused on the labeling, meaning the reprocessing instructions, um, and had a relatively smaller section on um, validation, on the testing that would accompany the instructions. Um, in contrast, the 2015 guidance has a dual focus on both the, um, the labeling, the reprocessing instructions, as well as the um, validation methods um, to support those, the, the labeling. 
Um, the 2015 guidance also includes a list of devices for which the reprocessing validation test report should be submitted to FDA for review, and that list includes duodenoscopes. Um, I want to make a note, though, that reusable devices that are not on the list are still expected um, to have appropriate reprocessing validation. It's just that the data would not um, routinely be reviewed by FDA. Um, FDA has always interpreted our quality systems regulations as requiring that manufacturers validate the design, including the reprocessing instructions of reusable devices to ensure that the device can be effectively reprocessed and safely reused over its use life as intended. And that expectation would have been present well before um, our 2015 guidance. Okay, so validation is um, defined as the procedure for establishing that a process will consistently yield product complying with predetermined specifications. Um, and for endoscope reprocessing, that essentially means we want worst case testing. Um, so for, um, for example, validation of cleaning instructions is conducted separately from testing for high level disinfection and sterilization. Um, there's going to be worst case soiling of the device worst case implementation of reprocessing instructions. Um, and in validation testing, each test sample should meet um, the pre-specified acceptance criteria and testing should include appropriate controls. So um, for cleaning validation of duodenoscopes, nine devices are typically used, although three devices used three, in three independent experiments may also be used. These devices will have had to either have undergone clinical use or simulated clinical use. Um, and in the testing itself, the channels are flushed with a blood-based soil. And, and the purpose of the soiling is to make sure that every part of the device that could possibly get soiled, that could possibly contact um, patient bodily fluids during a procedure does get, um, does get soiled um, in the testing. So the channels are flushed, soil is suctioned, the distal end is immersed in soil while the elevator is actuated with an instrument in place in the, in the biopsy channel. And after all this, soil is allowed to dry on the device. Um, at that point, the worst case implementation of the proposed, of the proposed cleaning instructions is conducted. So this means um, minimal flushing times, temperatures, et cetera. So I I just want to pause here and emphasize that there is a marked difference between the newer testing that was conducted to support the revised instructions, which were released within the past year, and the older testing that had been previously conducted. So without going into the details of the older testing, for at least some of those reports, FDA found that more robust testing was necessary to demonstrate an adequate safety margin. Um, so in terms of endpoints, um, the scope should be visually clean. Um, and because um, there are large areas of the scope that can't be, um, that aren't visually accessible, the device manufacturers extract residual soil off the devices and then measure for two quantitative um, components of soil, um, for example, protein and total organic carbon. Um, for high level disinfection, um, much of the testing is the same. There are nine devices or three devices used in three independent experiments. Um, the test soil used in this case is an, a suspension of mycobacterium in an organic and inorganic challenge, with the idea being that mycobacterium are a, um, they're a type of organism that are harder to kill than organisms like E. coli or Staphylococcus, so you're really challenging the system. Um, you're really challen you're challenging um, the system with a harder to kill microbe. Um, the organic suspension is typically 5% serum, with the idea being that um, high-level disinfectants um, are less effective in the presence of um, things like serum and salts. Um, the soiling method is similar to the, um, the cleaning soiling method in that channels are flushed, inoculum is suctioned, the distal end is immersed in soil, um, and inoculum is allowed to dry on the device. There is no cleaning of the device prior to conducting the actual high-level disinfection. This, um, this simulates a, a setup where there's inadequate cleaning conducted, so it's again a worst case um, situation. There is minimum high-level disinfectant flushing volumes, and after high-level disinfection, there's minimum rinsing. 
Um, after doing this testing, uh, the device manufacturer should demonstrate six log kill of mycobacterium at each of several locations on the device. Um, and then finally, um, EO sterilization um, typically uses a validation method referred to as the overkill method where bacterial spores are placed in difficult to access regions of the device. The device is exposed to half the cycle that it would normally encounter and then you expect to see complete microbial inactivation. So using these test methods, the I know this slide can't be read, but I wanted to demonstrate um, how many changes were made to the reprocessing instructions over the course of the past year. This is actually a high level summary of the um, changes to the reprocessing instructions that, um, that the device manufacturers made to their duodenoscope reprocessing instructions. Um, so the revisions are extensive. Um, and for further details, um, you should refer to the updated reprocessing manuals from each of the three duodenoscope manufacturers. Um, so with that, I'll stop. And if there are any questions, um, now I look at the end of the session.